All right, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for allowing me into your spaces. Um, I was really listening to uh, Jim's words as he was praying right now. I have a feeling that the enemy does not want us to gather around this topic tonight. I was very prepared, all settled, had my space set up. I was actually set up outside. And just as I logged in, my computer died. And I had to relocate and find something out, do something else really quickly. But I'm here and I am very happy to be here. Um, so I am just going to jump right in. I don't want to waste your time. I will be speaking um, generally about, about our topic and um, taking questions closer to the end. But I want you to feel free if I'm speaking about something that you have a burning question about or... Um, you may not be able to stay till the end. By all means, uh, raise your hand or type your question into the chat and I will try to address it as I go along. So we are in a very interesting time. Our winter ended with, uh, you know, <laughs> COVID-19 and then there's all of this um, racial tension and uprising in Canada and in the US, quite frankly, all around the world. And, you know, our children are not immune to all of what is happening. Um, but before I get started about talking uh, to the children, I wanted to sort of give a loose definition on what racism is. You know, it is a system that is built on the idea that, um, one race or social, you know, people say that race is a social construct, but your, your appearance, your uh, genetic, genetic differences, the hue of your skin, the curl in your hair, that somehow uh, one group of people has um, better traits or better characteristics than another set of people. And then the rest spills from that belief. Um, you know, there's systems that are built on that, uh, systems of exclusion, um, laws and so on, uh, around who can attain, who can ascend, um, who can have privileges, so on and so forth. Uh, outside of the system, then there are, um, then there's the individual racism, which is one individual believing that they are inherently better than another person because of uh, their features or um, their physical characteristics. Then there's the issue of privilege. Um, that can be really challenging to understand or even to explain because there are many people who will say, well, I wasn't born in privilege. I'm not rich. My family isn't wealthy. Uh, but, you know, when I was in school, they talked a lot about the systems of privilege and what that really means is when there is something in your life that allows you to, um, to have access where a, another person might not. So for example, I'm a black woman. I was born in Jamaica, but I have certain privileges. Uh, I do not need a wheelchair. I don't need an accessible ramp when I'm going into a building. I, my hearing works very well. Um, I have, my, my speech flows really, really well. Um, I wasn't born in wealth either, but I had access to education. And because of that, I have a career and I have gainful employment. That means I have privilege over someone else who may not have gainful employment, who did not have an education, who has trouble speaking, who has trouble moving their body, who has trouble hearing, and what happens is I have the ability to move through the world without thinking my speech, without thinking about, you know, whether or not, uh, so, well, without thinking about struggling to hear well. Uh, one of the things that came to my attention the other day was that in the midst of COVID-19, um, the hard of hearing, the deaf and hard of hearing community is struggling because everyone is now wearing a mask. And quite often they depend on lip reading. Everyone's face is half covered. And so that's a struggle. 
um, I'm privileged because that's something I never had to think about. So if you can walk through your life and never have to think about the color of your skin, or if you can walk through life and know, <clears throat> excuse me, that your, um, the challenges that you've had in life were, not, were in no way, shape or form a result of what you look like, then it counts as privilege, right? It's, it's sometimes it's, it's hard to, um, to take in, but it's something to think about. So the next thing is, you know, what are we talking about? Um, as I mentioned, our children are listening. Um, it's all over the news. Uh, if we were in school, then my kids would be coming home talking about it because whatever's on the news, uh, Often, even if we don't talk about it in our home, they hear about it at school and then they come home with questions to myself and my husband, Pervin. So it starts with us, the parents, the mentors, the teachers, the shepherds. We have to educate ourselves and understand our own stance on this issue, or we won't have a leg to stand on when we're trying to explain this to the children around us. There's gonna be a huge discrepancy between you know, there's going to be a huge discrepancy if you're telling them something and you're living something else because children know how to sniff it out, believe me. Um, how do you know if you need to work on these issues? Uh, I like to use the bull in the shoe analogy. If it makes you a little bit uncomfortable, then you're only going to walk so far before you need to take that shoe, out, shoe off and knock that pebble out. So if this is something that this kind of talk, all of this um, racial reckoning that we're all having to do, myself included, if it's something that is making you uncomfortable, then we need to, to, to tease it out, tease it apart and go, what, what is it about this that is making me uncomfortable? And, you know, in my circle, they call it doing the work, right? Let's do the work to uncover what is causing the discomfort. So that's what we're doing tonight. We're doing the work. Um, we're also doing this because as, as believers, as children of the Most High God, he calls us to live in unity, right? He wants us to love God and love others. But we can't love God and only love some of us or we can't love God and love some more than the others, right? We have to, it has to be across the board. And because God calls us to this, then we need to start having these conversations. It isn't, we've been talking, um, Elizabeth and myself and Jim and, you know, some of the other leaders at church. And personally, I've been saying to them, and most of them agree, I think we're all in agreement that this isn't happening now by accident. There's a reason that we're all stuck at home. There's a reason that this is happening. There's a reason that we're not even in the church building while, the, while, this, is while this is happening. Um, God is a very uh, on-purpose God, and he doesn't do anything by accident. So, okay. Um, the other thing that I would encourage you to do is to be patient with yourself as we're having these conversations. There's going to be a few things that maybe you've never thought of before, because maybe it's never impacted you before, right? But there are also things here that you are doing well, right? There's, as we're talking, you're probably going to be saying, mm -hmm, yes, I already do that. So some of it, it's really just going to be encouragement. So I encourage, I encourage you to, to embrace that. And if there are challenges, I encourage you to embrace that as well. Let's look at the challenges and, and, and try to forge forward as much as we can. Okay. So why do we need to talk about this with our children? Um, many of our children are at a stage where they might not be sure yet what they believe. Um, you know, very the very little ones believe what their parents tell them. And as they get into the teenage years and get closer to adulthood, they start to weigh it up themselves, right? And it's one of the reasons why we bring our children to church. We don't just expect salvation to knock them over the head. We, 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 we bring them in 
so that they can start to know about Jesus, so they can start to have a relationship with him. And then they, they can, you know, hopefully choose to follow Christ on their own. You know, Proverbs 22 says, train up a child in the way he should go. go. And when he's old, he won't depart from it. Um, so one of the things that some parents tell me is, or they ask me, you know, why do we need to talk about this with our children? Our children, they don't see color, they're colorblind, and we don't need to make this a thing. Well, the reality is our children are not colorblind, and they do see differences. Color isn't the only thing that they see. They do see many differences, but it is one of the things that uh, race or color is one of the things that they see. And we need to talk about it with them. Otherwise, they get the impression that it isn't something to be to be talked about. I was um, sharing with our group on Sunday that the example or the analogy of, let's say you're in a grocery store with a six-year-old or a seven-year-old, and maybe your circle is largely of your own ethnic group. And the child suddenly sees someone of a different ethnic group and says, mommy, or daddy, or grandma, how come that man over there, and before the child can even spit it out, we pull them along and say, shh, you know, we, we, we hush, hush it away. And what happens is that the child gets the idea or the impression that, is some, that this is something not to be talked about. It doesn't mean they no longer see it, but it means now that they don't talk about it anymore. The other thing that, that we need to be aware of is that if we don't start to talk to children about things like race, start to develop their own beliefs about this. You know, research shows that children as young as six months old can tell racial differences, differences in uh, the hue of someone's skin or, you know, the curl of their hair. Um, they notice it as infants. And at the age of three, they start to attribute positive or negative characteristics to those. And if they are not taught that there are no specific negative racial traits, at the age of four, they will to develop their own racial bias. So, you know, we just can't leave it to happenstance. We have to talk to our children about it. If you have it in your home and you have to discuss it with reasons to pass, there's still time. We could, um, one way to do that is to celebrate differences just by including them in the home. You know, this doesn't have to be a thing or a big issue. We don't have to make it um, a big project for the children. We, we don't have to, uh, when your children are small at least, we don't have to have a big race talk. Um, it is really important on the other hand to celebrate you know, that uh, children have, that different people have different skin tones and God made us like this on purpose. You know, I'll tell you a story. I share this with many people. When my older boy, Keenan, he's now eight, when he was in senior kindergarten, he came home from school and forgive me if you've heard the story before, he came home from school one day and when even we we're getting ready for bed and he said, mommy, how come I'm not peach? I haven't taught him the word white to attribute to Caucasian people, but he uses the term peach because that's what he sees, right? How come I'm not peach? And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, my teachers are peach. My principal is peach. The shepherds at church are peach. People at daycare are peach. How come I'm not peach? And it broke my heart. <laughs> Um, but what I ended up doing, uh, I believe that the Lord just sort of downloaded something in my brain. And I spoke to him about 
the wonderful differences. We're, we're, as parents, we're in, very involved in their school and we're familiar with many of the children in this class. And so I was able to speak to him about the differences um, in terms of the children in the classroom. So, you know, this person, um, so-and-so is a peach and so-and-so is a peach and so-and-so is a peach. And what do you think about their skin? Well, it isn't as dark as ours. It's kind of in between. And what do you think? And do you like it? And so we were just able to talk about the differences and the beauty in um, the multitude of skin tones in his classroom and in his school. And then I went on to say to him, in the same way, when you look at a, a beautiful garden and there's a, a, a house on our street that has splendid garden and we're always looking at the flowers. And I said, well, they don't just have one flower. God didn't make just one type of flower. He made tons and they're all different shapes and sizes and heights and colors and the petals are different and the sizes are different. So we started talking about the differences in people and how some people are taller and some people are shorter and some people are thinner and some people are wider and some people speak with an accent and some people don't. And that God made this beauty on purpose. And so I encourage you to have, well, it doesn't have to be a conversation like this, but similar conversations. And after I had that conversation with him, he was fine. He didn't need to learn anymore. And he was, he was only about five or six years old. So that's the other thing that I wanted to mention. When you're having these discussions with your children, we have to ensure that it's age specific. So we're not going to say the same thing to a 16 year old that we'll say to a six year old. A six year old really needs this much information, right? Six year old needs more. A 17 year old might say to you, what's happening on the news? Why did they do that to that man? And it is certainly okay to say, I really don't know, but it is more important to say, tell me how you feel about it. What does that mean to you? How is it making you feel, right? And we can, you can have discussions of uh, social justice and what it's like for certain people to walk in, walk in those shoes, so to speak, right? Um, it is really important as your kids get older, as your nieces and nephews, your grandchildren, your mentees, as they get older, to tease more out of the conversation. We can't just stop it as, well, that's how it is. Children need hope, and they're looking for us to give it to them. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that this conversation isn't it isn't dichotomous, it isn't black and white because God didn't just make black people and he didn't just make white people. Um, there are tons of um, racial differences and other kinds of differences, right? Differences in height, differences in, in hair texture, differences in how we speak, right? And as I mentioned, those things ought to be celebrated, but if we're not careful, then those of us who, um, who are not black or who are not white might feel like I don't have a place, right? And what about those of us who come from a different continent? What about those of us who are mixed? What about those of us who feel like they don't fall in either category? You know, um, it's really important to address that. It's really important to talk to their, your children about excuse me, how do you feel about what's going on in the news considering you're not black or white, right? The, the discrimination that you are hearing about, have you ever experienced that? Discrimination doesn't just happen to black people, right? It happens to people of all walks of life, of all nationalities, for all kinds of silly reasons, unfortunately, but it happens. And we need to talk about it or else the, we run the risk of making it seem as though it doesn't matter, right? And it does matter. I recently did um, a training with a school board with some children who are in high school and they were struggling with 
um, some of the racial injustices that they see in high school. And these weren't necessarily black children, right? And, 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 and they hurt. Um, okay, so I digress. I kind of veered off my notes for a second. Um, okay, so how to bring it up and what to say. Um, you want to be very sensitive and mindful with your children when you're bringing this up. When it relates to very young children, I often use cartoons and I use toys. Uh, Sesame Street is my friend. Um, I watch cartoons with my kids and I wait for moments when a child is being bullied or a child trips and they start to cry. I use that as a teaching point, right? My husband rolls his eyes at me, but <laughs> I use it as a teaching point. And I'll say, you know, what do you think happened? How do you think she's feeling, right? Um, you know, do you think that's fair? Small children have a very strong social justice meter. They're all about fairness, right? And so we can, we can address it from that standpoint. You know, what's happening isn't fair. And they might say, well, how come that's happening? And you can say, well, um, I'm not sure why that's happening. You know, um, some of the rules in a certain country or a certain area might not be fair. Or sometimes I'll say to my children, they don't know that the rules have changed, right? And, but what we can do, because we know that the rules have changed, here is how we can treat our friends. Here is how we can uh, treat our, our neighbors. And we often speak from a place of fairness. Now, when it comes to the older youth, the young adults, again, um, get their ideas. What do you think about this? You know, um, what do you think is, is wrong about this? How can we make a difference? Quite often, teenagers will think that, uh, will get frustrated about the idea that there's nothing that they can do. And I'm all about empowering them. How can we make a change? How can we ensure that this doesn't happen or that this isn't the case when you are 35, when you are 45, right? What can we do now? How can you make a change at church? How can you make a change in the community at your school? Uh, there is a writer by the name of Barbara Coloroso. I hope I'm saying her last name right. And she wrote a book, thanks Elizabeth, you're, you're nodding, thank you. She wrote a book called uh, the bully, the bullied, and the bystander. And it's really all about how you can help children navigate the world of, uh, of, of bullying and being bullied. One of the things that she talks about is what it's like as the bystander. And we often encourage children that when you see something going on wrong at school, if it is safe for you, Stand up for your friend, go and tell the teacher. Well, the same goes for issues of racial injustice, right? Stand up for your friend, go and tell a trusted adult, go and tell a teacher, come home and talk to me, you know what happened. Um, as it relates to differences, um, as you can already tell, I speak from the frame of reference of my children. <laughs> Um, but I often tell them, you know, when you see someone out there with a difference that you don't understand, come and talk to us first, right? Otherwise, we get, you can get a situation where parents will say to me, um, my four-year-old encountered racism on the playground. And what I say to that is that Oh, another four-year-old doesn't know how to be racist. They learned that language from someone else. They learned that behavior from someone else. And so we have to be mindful of the things that we're seeing. They pick it up. They hear it. They may not tell you that they're hearing it, but they hear it. They hear it at the dinner table. 
They hear it when the, the, the cousins and the uncles come over and they might be playing outside, but if the screen door is open, they're hearing it. And then they're gonna take it somewhere else and use that same language with their peers. So when someone says, when a, when a, when a, 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 ch a small child says to another, you can't play with me because your skin is dirty. And believe me, children have heard it all. Um, these, are, these are things that I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from other people. Uh, when they hear those things, um, they feel, when, the, when, when small children have to absorb those words, they feel as though they are um, uh, broken, they feel scarred, they feel shame. Uh, because it's it's as though something is wrong with them. Uh, Jim, did you have a question? No. Okay. Sorry. I thought I, I thought I saw you make a gesture. So right as I was saying, um, little children don't exactly they don't know how to be racist. They're repeating language that they've heard. But the trust those words, right? And it changes how they view themselves. Uh, and then you know. Parents of those children now have to have what is called in my community as the talk, right? When you have to tell your seven-year-old or your six-year-old or the eight, your eight-year-old that the world isn't as fair as they think it is and that they might experience um, difficulty growing up as a result of the, the color of their skin. But in terms of the young ones, um, we have to be mindful of how we are talking with them about race. We have to choose our words carefully. We have to be intentional. Um, we have to be, speaking of intentionality, um, I was speaking earlier about celebrating differences. So one of the things that I often challenge parents to do is what I call um, diversifying the, uh, the playroom or your bookshelf, right? Um, and what that means is take a look at the toys your children play with. Are they reflective of the community that they live in, right? Um, it may reflect your family, but your children don't just live in your family, right? They have to go to school. They have to go to church. They go with you to the grocery store. They go to swim lessons. They go to karate. And we want to ensure that we are helping them uh, make connections with the world around them. So, you know, it is definitely, those uh, different toys are definitely out there. Um, I don't have girls, but, you know, my girlfriends tell me that, uh, you know, Barbie is getting with the program and they have dolls now that look like me with different hair texture, have, they have dolls in wheelchairs, they have dolls of different height and width, and um, you know, dolls that look like they are from Southeast Asia, they, they just have dolls from all over the place. And I encourage you, you know, if you don't see this in your toy store, ask about it. Because the, the managers or the owners of these stores, they have the, um, and, and again, I'll use the term uh, privilege, of not having to think about this, right? It doesn't, it's not, because they, it's not because they mean harm, it just, it just means that they don't have to think about it. But parents, we should be thinking about it. And so diversify the toys, diversify your bookshelf. What do the main characters in the books of your children, what do those characters look like? Are all the characters blonde haired and blue eyed? Okay. I can't, I, I mean, I have some of those books on my shelf, but as a mom of two brown skinned boys, I have to ensure that um, they see a place for themselves in this world. And so I have to ensure that their books reflect them and their toys reflect them and the wider community, not just them. Right, and so I encourage you to take a look at some of those things. You know, I was very pleased, I believe it was last week or two weeks ago, I walked into Chapters and, or Indigo, 
I think it's called chapters now, and the, the children's section, um, Indigo Kids, I think because of what's happening these days, they just had a plethora of books written by not just Black authors, but um, Aboriginal authors and Chinese authors and Indian authors. And it was just so beautiful to see. Uh, there's a book, and I'll, I'll give you some of these resources at the end, but there's a book written by uh, a Black actor by the name of Tay Diggs, and the, 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 the title of the book is called, it, the, book, the book is called Mixed Me, and it's about children who are biracial. And I just thought it was beautiful that um, these children can now see themselves reflected in the books that they read, and that I can buy books about mixed children, even though I don't have mixed children in my home, but my kids can know that this exists out there and that their friends um, can be reflected in these books. Uh, you know, what, what do the cartoons look like out there? What do movies look like? The movies that you watch in your home, um, you know, the books that you read, the toys that, they play, that your children play with, encourage you to diversify it all. Um, okay, so the next thing that I want to talk about is what happens when your uncle twice removed come to, comes over for Thanksgiving dinner and he has some, what I would call, antiquated views, right? Um, challenge him in love. It doesn't have to be an argument, right? If it starts to have there, there, there starts to be raised voices, then I would say, let's, you know, let's just talk about this another time. But let's not, or let's not delve into this further, particularly in front of the children. But it is important for your children to see that you are challenging these thoughts. Otherwise, you're encouraging them to challenge these thoughts at school will only go so far if you are not challenging these thoughts in front of them. Or, or, or giving them, uh, modeling it for them, showing them how they can challenge it, how they can challenge it well, how they can challenge it without turning it into a fight. Um, unfortunately, there are people among us who um, have difficult opinions, right? And that's another thing that we will probably need to mention to our older youth among us, right? Um, there are people among us who will have difficult opinions, and we can disagree, but it, it is important that you practice what is right, and that you practice what is in your heart, and that you lead with that. Um, there are a lot of other things to discuss and get into, things like uh, the history that's being taught in school, right? discuss that with your children when they come home and they're doing homework and they're doing social studies or they're doing history and there's only a certain kind of history that is being taught or only a certain side of history that is being taught i would now talk to them about things like well you know after they finish the project you know pull them aside and go okay so there's so many other people that live in this land have you ever thought about their history right what what might have what it might have been like for their ancestors in this land and start to tease that out so they don't leave school. I can't tell you how many people I know who are my age who are telling me that they went through all of high school and they only talked about white history, right? Well, it is 2020 and Canada is, is, is you know, multiculturalism is a big deal in this country and it is unfortunate that we speak so wonderfully about multiculturalism, but we only teach a certain brand of history in our schools. Um, another way of discussing uh, race with your children without turning it into an issue or a project is, you know, and I know we're in pandemic land these days and restaurants aren't always open, but if you're going to the Mexican restaurant, or you're going to get Chinese food, you know, you're going to um, get, I don't know, Jamaican food. Talk about where this food is from. Talk about the people. Talk about the rich culture. 
um, go to cultural festivals, right? If you go to the food truck festival, right? And you're getting, I don't know, tacos, or you're going to um, Taste of the Dan, talk about the culture, right? And, 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 and discuss where people are from. You know, pull out a map, pull out the globe, look at, look, you know, look at where people are from. You know, when I was a little girl, the map was made in such a way that North America was right in the middle. That is troubling in itself, right? It's very um, North American centric, right? Um, but North America is not in the middle of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so glad that different maps are being made. These are some of the things that we need to think about and um, discuss and um, talk about with our children. And it is okay to unlearn with them, right? It is okay to say, you know, daddy was brought up believing so and so and so, but now I'm learning and I'm so happy to be learning it with you or teach me about these, these things that you're learning, right? Um, those of you who have teenagers probably know about the term woke, being woke, it's all about being woke, which means being hip to um, the uh, cultural relevance or social relevance in our times and being culturally or socially aware. And our children, our teenagers, they wear being woke like a badge of honor. Um, you know, they're so much woke, so much more woke than their parents. Well, you know, get your children to woke you up. Get them to, to teach you about these things. Get your grandchildren to teach you about these things. They will be happy to, right? You know, children often believe that we know everything. And as they get into teens, they start to challenge that. Well, you don't know anything. And, and suddenly they know everything. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about everything together, right? Um, I think it's a wonderful experience to be learning from each other. Um, some of my greatest moments in, in the work that I do in my therapy practice is when I work with teenagers, teenagers that are 17, 18, 19, and the 20 year olds, right? When they tell me about their world, because suddenly I'm old, right? Uh, they tell me about their world and I'm learning from them. And it is so cool. I'm teaching them about mental health and they're teaching me about Snapchat. Um, and if we talk about current events and they're hurting. They cannot believe that this is the world that they live in. They cannot believe that this is the world we're leaving them, right? And as I was speaking to Elizabeth last night, she mentioned the idea that it is our hope as adults that our ceiling will become their floor, which means that as we learn more and more, we're hoping that that will be the base of, for, for our children, that they, they will start from that and they will grow by leaps and bounds. I'm hoping that my children, when they're in their 40s, that they're changing uh, policy and rewriting law and um, challenging the framework that we live in, challenging our systems. Um, it is really, really important. Uh, you know, I, I'm just feeling prompting of the Holy Spirit. As I, I teach my children the Lord's Prayer and we talk about, um, you know, we ask for the Lord's kingdom to come um, here on earth as it is in heaven. Well, I don't believe that there is a heaven where some people get a bit of it and some people like, there is no, separation in heaven by race. <laughs> we don't get a certain amount of heaven because we look like Jim, or we get a certain amount of heaven because we look like Kevin, or we get a certain amount of heaven because you look like me with curly hair and glasses, or, or because you speak with an accent. God's heaven is beautiful. He made us all different and diverse on purpose. Heaven is going to ring true, I believe, with diversity. And if the heavens um, are going to be that way, wouldn't it be amazing for earth to reflect that? Um, I feel like I'm missing stuff. So um, I'm going to give my mind a minute to catch up. So I would 
entertain any question and I hope that I am able to answer them well. <laughs> so just a reminder, if you don't want to ask your question verbally, you can just send it to me in the chat and I'll read it out. Or you can put your hand up by clicking at the bottom of your screen. There's the reactions button and there's one if you watch my, oh, actually, what do you want? Should we do that for if you have a question? Or is there a different spot for it, Jim? It's not at the bottom. Maybe it's someplace else, but it's not at the bottom. <laughs> so you can do that if you want, or you can just type it in the chat and I'll read it out. Yeah, I don't see the uh, raise your hand feature on here, so I'm not I sure what either. that's that's about. Um, if if you're willing to, um, assuming you're going to raise your hand, just unmute your, your mic and let's hope that there's no cross interference and mm -hmm. uh, go for it. Or type it in the chat. Or yeah, you can type it in the chat to Elizabeth yeah. and... You can read it out. And I'll read it out anonymously. Oh, so I think what's happening is that because uh, Jim and I are co-hosts, we don't have a raise our hand but you do. So you actually can raise your hand by going down to the bottom to the reactions and selecting the raise your hand. So thanks Audra for letting us know how to use Roxanne? the Zoom. Yes. Yes. Roxanne? yes, good evening. Yeah, hi. Are we getting a lot better from this topic you're talking about? Are we getting better? A lot better. A lot better. Yeah. <laughs> I think that. Um, Tell me the truth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I only came to this country 21 years ago, but I have friends who came to this country in the 60s. And they were, racial slurs were being hurled at them in the streets. And they were being denied jobs because they were black overtly. Like people were telling them that you're not getting this job because of how you look. Or they would apply for um, rental accommodation. And when they got there, they would be told that it's gone now. I don't believe that those things are happening anymore. Um, but racial slurs still happen. I've had my share personally. Um, I've had, um, I've had very uncomfortable uh, situations and those things sting. But I do believe that we have gotten a lot better as a society. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't have further to go. We have a long way to go. Um, and this is probably one of the reasons why we're having this discussion. Um, it is important for us to, we can't just walk around and pretend that our differences don't exist. Let's put them on the table. Let's talk about them. Um, people have different, um, we all have different experiences in this world. And, you know, I had uh, just a case in point, um, you know, things may not be the same as they were in the 60s, but in uh, last fall, a friend of mine who is, uh, she's a black woman, she's actually quite wealthy, and she's a single woman, but she was registering her child for school, and um, because there was no father name listed on his paperwork, and presumably because she was a black woman, they asked her if she would need subsidized daycare. And she was just taken aback by that. And we have to recognize um, the things that are ingrained in the back of our minds. We have to start to unlearn some of these things and really sit with ourselves and ask ourselves the difficult questions. How is it that I have a family and my children are 
13 and 15 and we have no friends who are not white? Those are some questions that we need to ask ourselves, right? How come we, for example, my eight-year-old um, plays hockey. He's the only black boy in the team, right? He loves sports. And we tried to avoid hockey for the longest time because I'm from Jamaica and I do not do winter sports. <laughs> but he loves it. And he took to the ice like um, P.K. Subban. He was just all for it. But my younger boy, Micah, was the one who piped up one day in the arena and said, is hockey only for people with peach skin? <laughs> right? And so we have to, Keenan doesn't talk about it, but I talked about it with him one day. And I, I said to him, does it bother you? And he said, no, mommy, everyone on the team is really, really nice and the coaches are great. I'm so thankful for that. But we have to be aware that our children notice these things. We just cannot afford to, to pretend like it's not there. We can't hide our, put our head in the sand. Roxanne, two comments that have come through. Um, one, just in support of the fact that things might not be the same as they were in the 60s, but as recently as the 80s, there was still um, a segregated school in Canada. So it would be nice for us to feel like we were far away from that kind of um, horrible discrimination when in fact it's still in our very recent past and the lingering effects of things like um, the racial slurs that you have personally experienced are around because we are still so connected to those ingrained beliefs and um, perspectives. So that was one um, comment. The other, just to let you know, is that there is appreciation being expressed for your description of privilege at the start as a very helpful one to be able to think about someone with mobility challenges or someone who's hard of hearing to have to constantly compensate for that was a, a, a really helpful way to embrace um, what privilege means and how that then applies to um, things like skin color. So thank you very much okay. for, for that as well. Those are two comments sure, that yeah. have come in. Perfect. Any other questions? Um, I, think, I think somebody sent me uh, a question. I hope you don't mind me. Um, it, so you, you referred to when you thought, when your kids were talking about this, um, peach is a good word, uh, peach, um, to, to, to refer to white people. And the question was, why do you think peach is a good word or color to call white people? So that was just, I just, I don't that. necessarily, I, I don't have a, a, um, I don't think of it as right or wrong. That's just how my children, um, observe it because in our home we don't necessarily talk about black and white as a way of categorizing people by race um i actually have a today i was wearing sunscreen and it is sunscreen that's formulated for dark skin it's actually called a black girl sunscreen my younger looked at it and said why are you wearing this and I said, well, it's sunscreen for mommy. And he said, well, you're not a black girl. <laughs> because we, because he just looks, he looks at his skin and he says, well, this is brown, right? And he wouldn't look at Elizabeth and say, well, she, she, because she, she isn't white, right? When you look at a white sheet or a white pillowcase, that wouldn't compute for him. And so... They actually, just I'm use... so fair-skinned, it might actually be a good description, <laughs> but that's another topic. <laughs> uh, they just use the colors that they see. And while we talk about differences in our home, um, and we talk about uh, diversity in our home, we don't use terms. And, and maybe, that's, maybe that's something that I probably should do. I don't know. I'm learning just like the rest of us. Um, and I'm happy to... Um, if you guys have thoughts about that, I'm happy to think about it as well. Um, but um, I don't necessarily think of it as a, a right thing to do. Um, I just, I often reflect the language that they choose. 
And if it's, if it's, if it's incorrect, I will definitely tell them, like if they are um, calling people names or, or being unkind, then that's definitely something that we correct. But as it relates to how they observe things, um, I tend to sort of leave it as is. Somebody commented th that we can thank Crayola crayons for uh, the peach colored skin as being for white people. Um, there was another question, um, Roxanne, um, with reference to the comment about wanting our floor to be our kids' ceiling. What can we, the church, do differently to make sure our children surpass this current generation on the issue of inclusion and equity for all? Well, you know, um, as much as we're talking about how to talk to our children about this, I think that we could learn a lot from our children about this. Um, it does my heart so good, so much good, after church to go into the gym and watch our children play together. It is the most beautiful sight. Um, they play with each other with reservation. They play with each other without hesitation. There is no, let's gather in this corner because we're white over here and let's gather in this corner over here because we're black. Um, there is none of that. They just connect. Give me a basketball and we're a team, right? And I think that, and, and while I don't necessarily see uh, uh, segregation, I hate that word. I, I dislike that word. <laughs> I don't see that in our church, but there are, there are moments where people feel uncomfortable. Um, and I think that our children are already using our ceiling as their floor. They are launching off and making connections with each other. Um, some of Keenan's best friends go to Forest Brook and they don't look like him. He has a very healthy obsession with Caleb Pierce. He um, came to uh, uh, day camp one year camp concert. That was, <laughs> and I think that what we do right now is ensure doing it right. We're have first of all having the, the uncomfortable um, discussions. We are talking about. Um, what is potentially making people um, uncomfortable. We are talking about how we can move forward. We are talking about things like privilege. We're talking about things like racism. We are um, dismantling. You know, there are systems that are set up outside of our church. And I think God is now calling us into this space and saying to us, um, we need to be a part of the systemic change as believers, as Christians. And what we now need to do is, um, you know, as I, I, I challenge some of my Caucasian friends to, you know, call out racism when you see it, if it's safe for you to do. Um, challenge people who are, who are king, the, 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 the uncomfortable jokes. You know, when you are at a table and there's, only people who look like you challenge that. Um, how come there's no one here who reflects so and so, right? Um, make space for other people. If you are in a place where you can, you know, hold the door open. If you are a doorkeeper or a gatekeeper, then hold the gate wide open for other people to come in. Because for many people, that door is shut, right? Sometimes in some spaces. You know, with all of what's been happening, I don't know how many of you are on social media, but um, there are a lot of companies who took to social media talking about um, being open to diversity and inclusion. And the thought that came to my mind was, well, let's see your board of directors, right? What does that look like? How can you make the change so that it's not just at the front door? How can you make the change goes up? Right? Our children need to see that reflected. And um, at risk of going off in a tangent, um, what I often speak to is representation and permission. And what I mean by that is 
when my child comes home and says, none of my teachers look like me, that's a problem for me. And you know, I'm a bit of an advocate, so I've already spoken to the school board. <laughs> but um, what that says to the children is, you can't be a teacher, right? It says, there's no room for you there. And if they see leaders and none of the leaders look like them, it then says, you cannot be a leader. You know, um, I'm not sure how many of you know this, but a, a number of months ago, I left my employer and I'm now in private practice. And on the very last day of work, my children came into the office and we were getting boxes together and so on. And my, um, my manager walked past my door and sort of waved at the kids. And when he walked away, one of my children turned to me and said, that's the boss, right? And they had never met before. And I said, yeah, how do you know that? And he said, well, he has peach skin. And I was floored because to me, maybe I was overthinking it, but that now says, well, you can't be a boss or mommy can't be a boss or daddy can't be a boss because none of us have peach skin, right? And so representation, it gives permission. It says to your child, you can be that. Or it says, um, when, there, when there's diversity in the space, in the leadership space, it says, when you get there, if, if the child isn't black, when you get there, then it should be diverse. And when so you're you get saying there, that you're saying that should come into our church as well, right? In yes, terms of the sorry. representation. So <laughs> if we want the, Thank you. Our, that's okay. I just, I think you're making a really important point, which is that we need to ensure that as a church community, we're modeling these things. You said at the beginning, it starts with us. And I, I wrote it down in capital letters because I think that is so profound that, you know, if we want to see our children in that space, it starts with us and the behavior that we are engaging in. Um, and that, but then we have to be intentional around ensuring that, like you say, uh, when our children get to the place where they're the next generation leading us, that they have been welcomed and doors opened and gates opened and brought into the space so that there's representation and opportunity. I, I think that's such an important point, and you're pointing out such great examples of how easily kids can make presumptions about what is and isn't approachable to them. So if we actually want them to move into that space, we have to make that space for them and show them that it is available to them by making sure there's representation now. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you're on mute. So take yourself exactly. off. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> Go team. Yes. <laughs> Go team. <laughs> uh, yeah, I totally agree. And you know, when we, you know, where this is, this, this session is about, you know, it says how to talk to your children about racism, whether or not we actually say the words, we are talking to them about it. Mm. right we're creating an environment that screams it and they are listening with their eyes and their ears they're observing it all and they're taking it all in and so another... we need to go Sorry, ahead go finish. no go no. ahead i'm just telling you another question after okay so i was just saying we need to be mindful of what it is that we're showing them amen so um could the topic, the question is, could the topic of microaggressions be a way to discuss race with children? And um, what do you do when you, if you experience microaggressions or if your children experience microaggressions, what do you do? So maybe could you so, say what is a microaggression for everybody sure. just in case and then how it would be handled? Sure. So a microaggression is, um, it's a little hard to explain, but I do my, I'll do my best. It's, it's really covert racism. It's racism that's kind of, uh, it sneaks in there so subtly. That's why it's called micro. It's, and, and the thing is, is that those, of, those who um, engage in or, or, or um, uh, not a lot of words, those who engage in microaggressions are not, people who would consider themselves or that we would consider to be racist people, but we don't have to be racist people to do racist things. Mm -hmm. um, 
So my progression would be to say something like, um, and I've heard this one before, speak so eloquently for a black woman, right? Or um, you're not like the, oh, those, you know, like the other black people, right? Or um, I heard someone say that they're, they, that they actually encountered this in a professional space uh, she went to work, she has big, thick, curly hair. And someone at work said, uh, I guess she was wrapping up a project and someone was commenting on how well she did at work with her project. And they said, you must keep all those brains in your hair. And then they proceeded to put their hand all up in the woman's hair. <laughs> That's a microaggression. Um, saying things like, um, but you don't use street slang or um, not expecting my children to do well because they're black. Those are microaggressions. Or, you know, what um, uh, the school boards have been doing, which according to the government of Ontario, they're now going to put a stop to, which is streaming in high schools, which means that uh, some children do um, academic, classes or advanced classes and other children do applied classes. And what's been happening is that most of the children who get sent to the applied classes are children of color and um, they don't get a, a great shot at attending university or college. And so those things are microaggressions, just not expecting or being surprised that a, a good example of a microaggression at school is being surprised that uh, a child who's not white gets a good mark or not expecting them to be interested in science or pushing the black children to go play basketball. Those are, those are microaggressions. Um, I don't speak to younger children about microaggressions. I believe that those um, topics are a little bit advanced for the younger ears. What I do uh, do for younger children is I am clear to communicate that the sky is the limit for them and to ensure that, that they know, don't let anyone tell you that there's anything that you cannot do, right? You work hard, you study hard, it is all yours. Um, now, when it comes to teenagers, that's another thing. Um, you can introduce the concept of microaggressions, be careful to explain it well, and ask them if they have ever experienced that. Or say to them, have you ever experienced just being uncomfortable by things that people say or do as it relates to your appearance or um, how the expectations of you, what they you and the teenagers will be you know sometimes they might talk about it but once they get going they're quick to tell you about all the things that are happening at school right um i had one young lady tell me the other day that even we, were, we actually were talking about microaggressions and she was talking about the television and she said to me i believe that there are a lot of microaggressions that come through tv and I said, well, what do you mean? Tell me about that. And she gave me such a lesson. She said, you know, when I watch the Disney Channel, none of those shows ever have more than one Black person, ever. And so I started a new school last year. And when I walked, I walked in, she, you know, she's a fairly confident young lady. And she said, I walked into school and I was going to start, you know, walking up to people and introducing myself. And I saw a group of girls and there was a black girl standing amongst them. And I was very hesitant because I thought, well, they already have one black friend. And so that is how those subtleties, none of those things are inherently racist. None of those things are inherently discriminatory. But um, when these are things that our young people are seeing every day, right? it starts to become a part of what they believe. 
and then these are limiting beliefs. It starts to, they start to, to, to limit who they think they are. You know, there, there's, uh, again, around microaggressions, there's a thing, this idea around, um, I'm not sure if you guys have heard the term, this idea around the angry black woman. Um, it, there's this caricature that has been devised that, I, that black women are either nurturers or caretakers or they are um, just angry. They're the woman who's gonna snap the neck and you know make a big fuss about it, anything. And so um, because of that, sometimes um, young women will even um, they will silence their voice. They will self um, censor, right? They will choose not to speak up. They will choose not to present as, as frustrated or, or irritated because they don't want to, to push that stereotype. Mm. So th those are some examples of, of microaggressions. Perfect, thank you. Um, a comment was made that um, uh, ha there, there's this dynamic of, uh, you mentioned that it's when kids are really little, that it's not, it's a bit too complicated of a, conver of a topic to specifically talk about, but because schools are so riddled with microaggressions is there a way that can get talked about with kids where you can um, set children up to understand or have a lens to see what's happening without maybe complicating it too much for them um, mm -hmm. so that we can try to stop that at an, a younger age versus waiting until they're teens do you have any mm -hmm. thoughts on that um that's a good one um Oh, I don't take credit for it. It came from the question. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, um, so here's where um, my friends will say, you know, they feel like they have to have the talk with their children. And in the Black community, that means sitting your children down and explaining to them how racism is going to impact their life as they get older. Mm. Right? Um, you know, it is very painful for me um the idea that i have to talk to my children about you know one day someone's going to treat you differently because your skin is brown um but black people feel like they need to have the, this this talk with their mm -hmm. children because sooner or later something is going to happen where they are going to get um, put in the back, so to speak, because of what they look like. So if we and all have the talk with our kids, we if, should. We were, if we were all having this talk where That's we right. talked about how from a young age, you may notice that people aren't gonna treat other people nicely, especially sometimes when they don't look the same and it might feel like a little hurt um, or you might think it's a little hurt and not a big deal, like a big shove, just a flick, but you have to make sure your friends don't flick each other just like they don't hurt each other by pushing. Like, is there, do you think if we use language and said, so you can do that with your words and you have to talk to your kids that way with their, with um, that kind of an analogy so they can begin to say, okay, I'm not gonna, stand for that and I'm making sure I don't hurt with my words in little ways or big ways and we might not yes. call it a microaggression do you think if we collectively made a decision to do that it would give the right kind of lens or is that yes. missing the boat I don't think it's missing the boat I think it's um one of the things that I am it's such a fine line one of the things that I'm mindful of is giving children too much language at a young at, at a at an age where they're not able to um, they don't have the finesse to manage it all because then what can happen is that every time they're slighted they wonder is it because of how I look right and to be honest that's the world that a lot of adults live in right if you get pulled over by the police was it because i was going too fast or is it because of how i look if i didn't get the job oh, was it because i'm qualified or is it because of how i look right so that's the world that a lot of adults live in 
but adults have the life experience and the um the i guess self-reliance to be able to manage some of the, those emotions and a nine-year-old might not and so uh i think we can talk to our children in the same way and feel free i'm happy to have a dialogue around this um i think we talk to children in in um similar ways that we talk about things like bullying right children get bullied because of how they look children get bullied because of the shoes that they're wearing children get bullied because they have a peanut allergy like children get bullied the silliest things right but they also get bullied because of the color of their skin and not just bullied from classmates but teachers have poor expectations sometimes because of you know children who are from a different country or children who have an accent um, and these are things that we need to tease out and i cannot stress enough the importance of talking to our children it is not enough to say how is school fine okay that's that's not enough and i don't expect you to sit there and drill them about it either but your children need to know that the door is always open for every and anything mm -hmm. um you know even at bedtime for the little ones that's when the minds calm down and things float to the surface well today on the playground such and such happened and you can have a full discussion about that right even playing soccer with the older kids or folding laundry quite often with teenagers it's doing activities where you have to look at each other <laughs> right drying the dishes um cleaning up the garage sometimes these discussions can happen but mm. i cannot stress enough the importance of discussion there's one more question here and then i'm noticing the time is almost uh it's 25 after 8 i think we have this nice. earmarked till 8 30 so um a full time uh the question is roxanne have your kids ever expressed race perceptions when they listen to bible stories so for example asking you things like does jesus have a skin color and uh, do you maybe i'm going to add to that question just like so is that a place where we can be educating our kids around the fact that let's not make assumptions about what the color is like is this a good right. way to educate right so my kids have not asked about that but um the the children's bible that we use for our children is and it just happened to be so that it has people with lots of different hues right so they don't really ask about that um however there is one um thank god for jesus there's one story in the bible that we use a lot and it is um the story of the man who got beat up and the 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 good samaritan somebody help me that's the good it samaritan? <laughs> thank you got it. and um my older child keenan he is very sensitive to social justice and he asks lots of questions and um, the question that he asked was, how come those people didn't help him? He was hurt and he was bleeding because in the book he's bleeding. <laughs> he was hurt and he's bleeding. And those people, some of those people are from the church from me. How come they didn't help him? And I said, you know, I use that as a teaching point. <laughs> and I said, they didn't help him because he was from a different place. And sometimes in our world, there are people who don't like each other because they're from different places and I, then i look to him and i'll say to, i said to him what do you think about that do you think that's fair and that took on another discussion and we were able to just tease it out right um just around uh no that's not fair and what do you think about this man this man wasn't from his country and he helped him anyway that's what i would do mommy <laughs> right and so able to have some of those discussions when we are um, reading and talking and watching cartoons and drawing and you know coloring I'm gonna color my person blue can he be blue of course he can be blue you know let's talk about all the different people who have different color like, there's so many options there's lots of different ways to talk about 
things with the children. But specifically my children, they have not yet Ooh, they have not yet asked about <laughs> whether or not Jesus has a specific color. Um, and, you know, to be honest, if they did, I would ask them if it mattered. Right? He loves us because of who we are. He made us like this on purpose. And if he made us, then why wouldn't he love us how he made us? Just how he made us. It doesn't matter what he looks like. <laughs> That's what I think. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you.